Welcome back everybody. Here's another video lecture on the atomic structure. Tonight we're going to be talking about section 4.2 and this is where we're going to talk about the historical developments of the atom. Some of the information here is kind of just information that you are going to have to memorize for the test and for the next chapter on electrons. So I'm going to go ahead, try to keep it interesting, try to point out the important points this evening. Tonight, before we get started discussing the historical development of the structure of the nuclear atom, I just want to review the objectives. So tonight we're going to be talking about the three types of subatomic particles, and I bet you already can do that one. And then I also want you to describe the structure of atoms according to the Rutherford model. So what is this new nuclear model? So the first thing to know is from the last section we talked about Dalton, and Dalton was the first one to come up with a what we would call the more modern atomic theory. But as we learned more about the atom, we found that we needed to make some changes to his theory. So the one change to Dalton's atomic theory is that atoms are divisible into subatomic particles. Remember, he said that atoms were not divisible, okay? And we now know that they are divisible, meaning that they can be divided, and that they, they can be divided into protons, or sorry, electrons, protons, and neutrons. So these are examples of fundamental, or we also might call them subatomic particles. So there's also other types of particles, but we are going to, we won't study them in this class. As you get into more advanced chemistry classes, we'll talk about quarks and different things. So one of the first people besides Rutherford that I want you to know about in Dalton is J.J. Thompson. And what he did is he used this thing called the cathode ray tube to deduce or to discover the presence of negatively charged particles, what we now call the electron. So the way this thing worked was that he had high voltage, so basically electricity going through here, see the wire coming down, and as it passed from the cathode to the anode, and so you can see the negatively charged particles over here is going towards the positively charged particles here. But what we notice is when we added this positive plate up here, notice the curve of this line, that the curve of this line is moving upwards. So whatever this subatomic particle was, and remember at the time he didn't know it was an electron, it was attracted to the positively charged plate, and so since opposite charges attract, this particle that was moving through here must have also been negative. So why the last slide, the picture of the cathode ray tube, may look archaic or maybe something you've never seen before, you actually probably have. So a cathode ray tube is also known as a CRT, so if you have a CRT television, in fact, I still have some of these old ones in my house. They're the ones that actually have a gas tube inside them, or these ones with the computer monitors, you can tell the, the fat backside here. These actually also have tubes with gas, just like in the previous experiment, and as a current ran through them, it produces these electrons. And so a cathode ray tube passes electricity through gas, that gas tube I was saying, that is contained at a very low pressure. So they're generally very safe, but that's why if you were to drop one of these old televisions or old monitors, they wouldn't work anymore because you're not able to have that gas contained in the tube. After the electron was discovered by J.J. Thomson and it was found to be a negatively charged particle, the next discovery that came about was in 1916 by Robert Millikan, and he determined the mass of an electron. And the mass of an electron, and this is hard to say, is 1 1840th the mass of a hydrogen atom. So it's not half the mass of a hydrogen atom. It's not a quarter or a hundredth the mass. It's almost one two thousandth the mass of a hydrogen atom. And it has one unit of negative charge. This is what he stated, was that it's very small, much smaller than a hydrogen atom or a proton, and it has one unit of negative charge. And so then you can actually see the mass of the electron up here is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 28 grams. It's obviously a very, very, very small particle. So the conclusions we had from the study of the electron were that cathode ray tubes had identical properties regardless of the element used to produce them. So it didn't matter what type of gas we put in these tubes, they had the same properties. So all elements must contain these identically charged electrons. 
The next item here is that atoms were discovered to be neutral, and so there had to be a positive particle in the atom to balance out the negative charge. And the next idea was that electrons have so little mass that atoms must contain other particles that account for the most of the atom's mass. So again, all the tubes acted the same, so they all have similar or same electrons. If we have negatively charged particles and atoms are neutral, meaning they don't have a charge, there must be a positively charged particle to balance out the negative charge. And that since electrons are so darn small, there has to be other particles in them, and we'll discover later protons and neutrons also make up the atom. So then Eugen Goldstein in 1886 observed what is now called the proton. And this is, of course, we now know is a particle with a positive charge and a relative mass of one, or about 2,000 times that of an electron. The next discovery was in 1932 by James Chadwick. He confirmed the existence of the neutron, a particle with no charge but a mass nearly equal to the proton. So important thing here to know is not necessarily their names and stuff like that, but that a proton's size is just about equal, I'll put the like just about equal, to the size of a neutron. I like this chart here, it describes the three main subatomic particles. So we have an electron with a charge of negative one and its mass 9.11 times 10 to the 28th. And we know the, the location of it is the electron cloud. The next subatomic particle is a proton and it has a positive charge and it has a size of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 24th grams. So look at this exponent here, 24, negative 24th negative 28th. So this one is bigger than this one up here. Okay, I know the exponent is not necessarily a bigger number, but notice there's a negative in the front. And protons are found within the nucleus of the atom. And then the next one is neutron, and it has no charge. That's why there's a zero there. Look, it's roughly the same size. It's actually identical in this case, but if we were to add more significant figures, you'd see it's a little bit different. Um, the size of a proton, and it also is in the nucleus. So I would definitely copy this charge down. You don't have to remember the mass of each of these different subatomic particles, but if I was to ask you which subatomic particle is the smallest, you would need to say it's the electron, which is the biggest. You would probably say the proton or neutron. Those are both there. You also do need to remember the charges on these. So an electron has a negative charge, a proton has a positive charge, and a neutron has no charge. Now the next thing we want to talk about when we talk about the atomic model is Dalton thought of the atom as being a solid hard sphere. And since we changed his model and we added that particles could be divisible or separated or divided, the next logical thing was Thomson's atomic model. Thompson believed that electrons were like plums embedded in a positively charged pudding, thus it was called the plum pudding model. Now I know we're not particularly familiar with plum pudding, but just think of like pudding with like raisins in it basically, or that's what they would have plums inside their pudding. Um, I also prefer to call this like the chocolate cookie model. So. What it is, is the dough would be like where you'd find all the positively charged particles, and then the chocolate chips would be these negatively charged particles that you're seeing up here. So again, think of the dough as holding all these positive charges, and then the chocolate chip cookies as being the negative charges, and this was Thompson's atomic model. Well, I'm hoping that you think that the chocolate chip cookie model doesn't sound much like the model that we currently have about an atom. And it wasn't until Ernest Rutherford and his gold foil experiment that we got what we consider our modern day structure of the atom. So the way that Ernest Rutherford's experiment worked is he took an emitter device and he had these alpha particles. So you can see these red things. And alpha particles are a type of radiation and what happened is these alpha particles would come in, they would strike the gold foil, and most of them would pass right through. I hope you can see all these arrows back here. So most of the gold, uh, most of the alpha particles would go straight through the gold foil. But what he noticed is that some of them came back at pretty darn sharp angles. So there had to be something in the gold foil that was deflecting 
these positively charged alpha particles. So here it says alpha particles are helium nuclei, and so that means they're positive. The alpha particles were fired at a thin sheet of gold foil. Particles hit the detecting screen. Film were recorded. So as the electrons hit this blue area, they were recorded, and so the scientists were able to analyze the data. So here we have some examples of why the angle that the electrons were hitting on that detecting screen were important. So it says in the following picture, there is a target hidden by a cloud. To figure out the shape of the target, we shoot some beams into the cloud and record where the beams came out. Can you guess the shape of the target? So in this case, we can see all these electrons are being shot in, and then all of a sudden they're bouncing off. Coming in, bouncing off. So what shape do we have here? Now if we look over here, I can see that some of the particles are passing straight through. Here's number two. I feel like it's kind of being deflected here. Here this one's bouncing straight back at me. Number four, I have an angle with this one. And number five again is kind of just passing right through. So what shape do you think this one is? Make your predictions for target one and target two. Well, I'm hoping that you came up with something like this. For target one, it's a triangle. And you can kind of see, okay, it bounces off at an angle. If you hit right on the nose, it's going to come right back at you. Then over here, you can see like they come off at various angles, so there is a circular shape. So the idea is when we look back at the detecting foil, that was that blue strip of paper that you surround, saw surrounding the gold foil, is that the, all the atoms didn't just come and bounce here and come and bounce here or didn't bounce straight back. They kind of bounced at random at random angles around the around the gold foil. And so some of them were hitting here, some of them were hitting here, some were coming back at them. So this shape of an atom had to be a spherical or a circular shape. So what did Rutherford conclude from his experiment? He found that most of the particles passed right through. A few of the particles were deflected, meaning that they bounced back at an odd angle. Very few were, de were greatly deflected, meaning that they came like straight back at them. And his quote here, that's just interesting, he said with the alpha particles, it was like a howitzer shell bouncing off tissue paper. So that's how surprising it was that these alpha particles bounced back that were greatly deflected. So this was really a surprise for him. So the conclusions that he drew from his experiment were that the, is that the nucleus must be small because most of the particles flew right through the gold foils. So there must be a lot of empty space. That the nucleus is dense, that the particles are packed closely together, or otherwise the alpha particles wouldn't have bounced back off at such a severe angle. And that the nucleus is positively charged. And the idea here that it's positively charged, well, the alpha particles were also positively charged. So the alpha particles would have been attracted and stayed close to the nucleus if it was an opposite charge. But since the alpha particles positively charge, the protons are positively charged, they deflect and they move away from each other. So a little continuation, a little more explanation from his atomic model that we were able to gain for our modern atomic model is that the atom is mostly empty space. You remember hearing this in the Brain Pop Atoms video. Um, all, po all the positive charge and almost all the mass is concentrated in a small area in the center, and this is called the nucleus. And this makes sense if you think back to our modern current model, the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, and they are much larger than the electrons are. So that's why the mass is concentrated or mostly found inside the nucleus because these two subatomic particles are found in the nucleus. The nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons. We kind of just said that. The electrons are distributed around the nucleus and, and occupy most of the volume. And his model is now called what we call the modern nuclear model. Well, that concludes our history. I'll briefly go ahead and mention these models again tomorrow in class. Next chapter, we're going to go ahead and add some more information about the discovery of these particles and develop this idea of the atomic model into the new quantum mechanical model for next chapter. Please remember, if you had questions, write them down. Review this PowerPoint. Uh, make sure that you filled in the, fill in the blank notes. Okay, see you guys later. Bye.